Seeing a name on an Australian map does not always guarantee it's a town location. In my travels, I've noticed in some cases, names found outside the main cities and towns indicate nothing more than a railway siding, a wheat silo or a homestead. In some cases, the name could just show where a service station is located. Some names remind me of past destinations and my thoughts are often directed towards going back and seeing how much has changed. We travelled from Melbourne through Yea and Seymour, all the time heading north through Victoria until we reached the Murray River and crossed into New South Wales. We joined the Cobb Highway at Daniloquin and travelled the last 124 kilometres to Hay on a sealed road which was in good condition. On both sides of the car, we passed incredibly flat landscape and straight stretches of road that continued for kilometres before rounding a curve to show more of the same flat terrain. South of Hay, we observed nests in the trees and stopped to investigate. What we found were homes of the possession caterpillars so called because they lay down a silk thread that is irresistible to other members of the group. In turn, they start to follow each other in a single file. Though we didn't witness this behaviour, I did manage to film a couple of them outside their nest. Much of the time we were driving through unfenced cattle country and on occasion some birds were even grazing on the side of the road. It's a long drive from Melbourne and when an interesting looking pub came into sight we decided to take a break from driving and headed into the bar and joined fellow travellers for a couple of cold ones. to the outskirts of Hay, we crossed the Murrumbidgee River. The banks were once occupied by at least three separate Aboriginal groups. The first Europeans to reach this area was the Charles Stuart expedition. They passed here in 1829. In the late 1850s, Captain Francis Cadell placed a manager at Lang's Crossing Place with the task of establishing a store. Over time, Lang's Crossing Place became known as Hay. Its growth established it as an essential hub for the surrounding district. The town became an important holding centre. From there, the Victoria and South Australian markets could be supplied with cattle as required. Our first day was now over and almost 500 kilometres was added to the car's speedometer. We found a caravan park near the river and settled in for the night. We left town around 8 the next morning and continued 38 kilometres north, passing mostly treeless plains predominantly consisting of alluvial sediments of salt, clay and fine sand. The last time I was here was over 10 years ago. On that occasion, the One Tree Hotel was a wreck. You could actually walk through the rooms where I found it in a terrible condition. The only nightly occupants were sheep, including one that had decided to end his days in one of the rooms. For me, this was a great disappointment because I planned to film inside. 
Instead, I decided to fly my drone over the building, which would give me a different perspective to the nearby countryside and filmed from as many angles as I could. The hotel was first known as Finch's Inn and was built in 1862. After Alexander Finch sold the property to William Clark, it became known as the One Tree Hotel. It was given that name because a large gum tree was grown on a clay pan near here. Unfortunately, that tree was destroyed by a storm in 1900. Since the 1870s, the hotel was used by Cobb & Co as a watering place for its stagecoaches, which made the run between the Murrumbidgee and the Lachlan Rivers. Frank McQuaid was the last publican until 1942 when he relinquished the hotel's license. To this day, the structure is still owned by the McQuaid family. For the next 170 odd kilometres, the landscape didn't change much and we proceeded without any worries along the well-sealed Cobb Highway. I have a fascination of country railway stations. Some of them look so sad because the glory days of steam have now been forgotten. The Ivanhoe Railway Station opened in August 1925. It was the end of the line until November 1927 when it was extended to join the Broken Hill Line. I'd seen this town on my New South Wales maps for years and had never actually visited the location. In 1869, George Brown Williamson a postmaster and storekeeper purchased 40 acres from a pastoral company and this land became the township of Ivanhoe. He selected the location as a business opportunity because it lay on a well-used coach and stock route connecting Wilcannia and Balronald. George Williamson was a native of Scotland. He named the town after Sir Walter Scott's historic novel Ivanhoe which was set in England during the 12th century. The town still functions as a service centre for the surrounding area and has a population of around 200. The last few hours on the road had made it necessary to clean out the front of the car because quite a few insects had misjudged their flight path and didn't fare too well as a result. Less than 20 kilometres north of Ivanhoe we hit the first of the dirt tracks. The condition of the track ranged from bad corrugations where I had to reduce my usual legal speed of 110 km per hour to around 60. On some sections, the speed managed to creep up to 100, but that speed often had to be quickly reduced to avoid holes in the road, washaways and the ever-present bull dust. It was along this stretch we passed names on the map that indicate that homesteads were nearby and at one spot I actually stopped to film a property.
We spent about an hour looking around Wilkenya, and I can say that I was very impressed with the sandstone buildings. In 1835, Major Thomas Mitchell was the first European to explore the region. By the 1870s, the population was only 264. Within 10 years, that had grown to over 3,000 residents. In the days of the paddle steamers, it was one of the many Darling River ports which played a vital part in the transport of goods, including wool and wheat, to inland Australia. Our destination for today was White Cliffs, located to the north of Wilkenya. Thankfully, the road was sealed all the way. I had never ventured into this part of New South Wales before. We were here to see the opal mines. To get an idea just how many mines are in the area, a view from the air was required. So the drone was taken out of the case, made ready to fly, and under windy conditions took to the air. A dirt track just north of the town takes you on a loop around the diggings. The opal discovered on Mumba Station in 1884 was the first commercial seam in Australia. It was easy to dig into the soft sandstone and soon mining shafts appeared across the landscape. A geologist from Adelaide named Wollaston became the first opal buyer in Australia. He promoted the opals in Europe and America. His efforts made this naturally beautiful and rare gemstone popular once again. The opals in this area displayed vivid colours which had never been seen before, even better quality than the Hungarian opals that had been mined out 100 years earlier. By 1890, the settlement was named White Cliffs. The name derived from the white underlying sandstone of the nearby hills, contrasting with the red topsoil typical of this area. As a result of the many opal strikes, the township grew to around 2,000 miners, with many more businesses providing services for them. It seemed wherever you dug a hole, you struck quality opal. Building materials were scarce and a nearby mining town was dismantled and used for housing. The temperatures in this part of New South Wales can reach into the high 40s. Some miners decided living underground was a better option, converting their old mines into homes. This practice still occurs today with a number of residents still living in homes cut into the side of cliffs. Production peaked in 1902 when 140,000 pounds of opal was mined and sold to the world markets. For the next 10 years, the town slowly dwindled as the richer area of the field was mined out and conditions proved too harsh to continue. We totaled 484 kilometers today. 160 of those were on a rough track. Our journey to western New South Wales was on a tight schedule, so time didn't allow us staying another day. Tomorrow, we start our homeward journey back to Melbourne.